Our next speaker is Aaron Miller. He's uh, is a professor at, at BYU, and we're really happy to have him with him today to talk about a subject that honestly is near and dear to my heart as well, that's church finances. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Aaron Miller. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know whose idea it was to schedule a session on finances on a Friday afternoon after you've all had lunch and have already worked your brains hard thus far today, hearing some very smart people. Um, I, uh, so, th like with Scott, this is a topic that's very dear to me because it overlaps so heavily with what I do professionally, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but. Um, it's also a topic around which there's a lot of misconceptions, some deliberately generated, many innocently uh, just misunderstood, but it's worth spending some time. Now, I will warn you though, I have prepared a lot of material here. Um, and so I'll be going through it, hopefully not like skimming too shallow so that it's not useful to you. Um, and, and hopefully, like I said, not covering too much, but the material I'm covering, I, you know, there are enough details and enough different controversies and, and other issues that uh, are worth mentioning that I tried to fit in as many as I thought was wise, which maybe was too many, but we'll see. So um, just a quick outline of what we're gonna cover. Um, uh, we'll talk just about a brief financial history of the church. Um, I have a little timeline that has a bunch of things that nobody other than me maybe would care about. <laughs> and I'm not a church historian either, by the way, so I should qualify myself that way. Um, we'll talk about church finances today, what we know, what we don't know. Uh, the church as it relates to US tax law, specifically its charitable status, its charitable tax status with uh, the federal government. Uh, we'll talk about the SEC settlement and some interesting details related to that that are often overlooked. Um, We'll talk about the James Huntsman lawsuit and similar lawsuits uh, alleging that the church defrauded tithe payers. Um, we'll talk about transparency in general because the issue of the church's transparency around its finances is often discussed. Uh, we'll talk about church finances in context uh, compared to other large wealth funds. Uh, the church is a philanthropy, which is a very common discussion point um, about what the church ought to do with its money. Um, and then finally, I'll just end by sharing why I pay tithing um, in the context of everything else we've already dis we will have already discussed. Uh, just a bit about me. So I, do, I teach at BYU. Um, I teach in the Romney Institute of Public Service and Ethics. I've taught there for um, uh, altogether now 18 years. One of my colleagues is here, Larry Walters, who I deeply admire and miss dearly since he retired. So it's happy to see you, Larry. Um, and... Uh, and I also am an associate director at the Ballard Center for Social Impact, um, which is one of the largest social impact centers in the world at any university. Um, we have thousands of students every, every year uh, working on improving the world in, meaning, in all kinds of meaningful ways. Um, I teach business ethics, I teach nonprofit structure tax and, and finance classes, um, and also do research and writing around philanthropy and ethics. Um, and serve on a couple nonprofit boards. So let's dig in. And, and like I said, I'm gonna try to go fast enough that we have room to cover this broad range of topics, but also to give you enough detail to kind of point out some things that are maybe not commonly known. Um, here's a very condensed timeline of moments in church history that are relevant to the topic today, or to this topic specifically about church finances. Um, it was in 1841 that Joseph Smith was named as trustee in trust of church assets. So the original sort of legal structure under which all the church assets were owned and managed was actually a trust, not a corporation, uh, that did eventually change. Um, it was in 1844 that the management of, of church finances shifted to the Quorum of the Twelve. 1877 is when uh, President Taylor uh, organized the, the first audit committee for the church uh, to oversee the management of the church finances. Um, and then it was in 1899 that uh, President Snow received his famous revelation on tithing, um, which uh, rescued the church from pretty dire financial circumstances. 
It was in 1916 that the church actually started to operate under a corporation. Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment to be clear. A corporation is a kind of legal structure that doesn't necessarily Im imply shareholders or for-profit. The fundamental nature of a corporation starts with just having a board of directors, and the board collectively decides what should happen, and then the corporation is subject to the decisions of the board. That's the core identifying attribute. And under the law today, you can have both for-profit corporations, which means there are owners, like shareholders, for example, or alternatively, you can have what are called non-profit corporations, which are corporations that don't have shareholders. They have no owners. Um, it's actually kind of a legal oddity in a sense that, it, that there's something that you can create that also is not owned by anybody. But non-profit corporations are controlled um, by the board of directors. It was in 1923 that the corporation of the First Presidency um, and also the Zion Securities Corporation were created. Uh, 1959, the church ended its practice of reporting financial details in General Conference. Between 1915 and 1959, the church did report to church membership at General Conference uh, general, like, like general details about the state of church finances. It wasn't until 1959 that that practice ended. Um, in 1963, uh, President N. Eldon Tanner was not only called to the Quorum of the Twelve, but was put directly into the First Presidency um, to implement and manage church finances more carefully. It had to do with the fact that the church had overextended itself in constructing chapels throughout the world, and uh, President Tanner was asked to essentially rein in church spending. Um, and then it was in 1990 that a change was made so that all local expenses um, would be paid out of a general tithing fund so that a ward would get its, it wasn't until 1990 that a ward would get its budget from the church and then spend out that way. Um, a lot of expenses were not centralized that way until 1990. Uh, 1991 was when LDS missions were equalized. There's really, I mean, if, you're, if you geek out over nonprofit law like I do, this is actually a really interesting topic. Because if I make a donation to a charity, but I tell that charity the money has to go to this individual, then that's not a deductible donation. I don't get to claim that, I don't get to claim that on my taxes. The church actually negotiated with the IRS to craft a missionary support system, financial support system, that would allow for charitable tax deductions. And, uh, and so supporting missionaries today means that you can also deduct that from your taxes because your support doesn't go to your missionary. It goes to the missionary fund and supports all missionaries. And the equalization is part of the reason that that flies under tax law. Um, and. Uh, Anyway, it's one of those things I geek out about. I think it's cool. It's very savvy, actually, on the part of the church to figure out to do that. And plus, I think it accounted well for the discrepancies that would happen, uh, the financial discrepancies that would happen to families based on where you were called. To illustrate this, my oldest brother was called to serve in Paris in the late 80s. And supporting a missionary in Paris was, I think, maybe at the time, one of the most expensive missions in the world to support a missionary, and that was, a, you know, our family was the first direct uh, responsible party. Um, anyway, fast forward, uh, let's see, uh, about eight years, and my younger brother was called to serve in Paris, but by this point, the church had equalized missionary financial support, so we breathed a sigh of relief <laughs> the second time around. Anyway, okay. Um, in 1997, Ensign Peak was incorporated. Ensign Peak is at the center of a lot of the controversies that you see in the media about church finances because it is the nonprofit that manages the majority of the church's financial holdings. It didn't exist until 1997. The church manages financial holdings just within the church proper. Well, I should be careful what I say there because the church is a lot of different legal entities. Um, but it was in 1997 that Enzyme Peak was created. Um, Enzyme Peak is also a nonprofit, even though its primary purpose is to invest financial resources. It is appropriately a nonprofit under tax law, um, and we'll talk about that in, in a bit. 
It was in 1999 that you see the market increase in temple building. Temples are expensive. A friend of mine who works in the missionary department was part of the MTC um, additions that were built. And the way he tells, maybe I'm not supposed to tell anecdotal stories like this that I didn't witness firsthand. I'll tell you. President Packer leaned forward and to the committee who was proposing this budget for the MTC additions and said, how many temples is this gonna cost me? So I love that story actually, because it illustrates the really like deep importance and huge financial commitment that the church makes to build temples around the world. Um, okay, moving on, um, 19, or sorry, in 2013 was when the church first started publishing humanitarian aid reports. Uh, the most recent of those was published earlier this year. Um, in the previous year, the church announced that they spent over $1.3 billion in um, humanitarian aid um, here in the U.S. and throughout the world. And then in 2019 is when everything kind of broke open with criticism and speculation and so on. Now, obviously, there had been a lot of speculation about church finances up to that point, but it was in 2019 that uh, the IRS, whistle, IRS whistleblower report became public. Um, and, uh, and it was when Enzyme Peak first started filing a form called the 13F, which is part of the SEC settlement that we'll be talking about in a moment. Okay, uh, it's worth pointing out, there's a, there's a common belief that the church struggled mightily in its finances for the majority of its history until President Tanner showed up. And then from that point on, it's been a steady set of uh, improved financial fortunes. Um, that's not actually true. The church has had swings up and swings down all the way up until President Tanner. Um, for example, in the 1940s, the church spent just 28% of annual tithing revenue. So its annual expenses were just 28% of what it was collecting and tithing during that period in the 1940s. But then fast forward to 1962, just prior to President Tanner and the church had run that year a $32 million deficit. Like I said, driven largely by building chapels. Um, another interesting uh, historical point to make is how church humanitarian uh, efforts have, uh, sh where they show up in history. This is fascinating to me because of the family connection. It was in 1936 that the church welfare program was started, um, led by Elder Melvin J. Ballard. This Elder Ballard is the namesake of the Ballard Center for Social Impact that I mentioned earlier. But it was in 1985 that the church's humanitarian efforts, international humanitarian efforts, first began to grow at scale. And interestingly enough, that was when Elder uh, M. Russell Ballard visited Ethiopia to respond to the famine on behalf of the church. Um, and so Elder Ballard, the younger, who we sadly lost recently, is um, the grandson of uh, Melvin J. Ballard. Um, and so it's, and it's really touching, actually. Uh, I think this is on YouTube. Uh, there's a Ballard Center video of uh, M. Russell Ballard, Elder Ballard, speaking about his grandfather. Um, so anyway, th this is, uh, I think, the most important thing I want to the most important point I want to make today, despite even considering all the details and, and sort of nuance that we're going to get into. What I feel like most people don't understand or haven't thought all the way through uh, in criticizing the church around its finances is that they haven't considered that this today is easily the largest and most complex the, 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 the Lord's church has ever been on the face of the earth going all the way back to Adam. There has never been a time when the church has been in as many places, has had as large of uh, financial expenditures to carry on its work, um, has uh, had to deal with as many government uh, regulations. Uh, today is the most complex version of the church that has existed in history, and it's what we would expect today. Sometimes people, I think, sort of pine for this very unreasonable idea that the church today should be like the ancient church from prior times, that somehow it ought to be simpler, you know, um, uh, you know, just less complicated and, and, you know, less worried about legal regulations and so on. 
Governments have never been as complex in history as they are today. And the church has to operate within the context of government laws and regulations, not just here in the United States, which are immensely complicated, but throughout the world. And because of that, for the church to carry forth its work, but to also respect the laws of the land, uh, it has to operate in a, in a pretty complicated way. If any of you have ever had a chance to know or have a conversation with any church area legal counsel, for example, all the area offices have a, a, a church attorney assigned to them. And church area uh, uh, legal counsels um, have the job of sort of managing all the legal complexities of the church just in that area of the world. And uh, what they deal with is constant and quite complicated, but that's just the nature of doing this work everywhere they go. So with that in mind, let's get into some of the more detail. Church finances today, let's talk about what we know. Um, we know that some of what the church owns is publicly disclosed um, uh, through what's called a 13F filing. This is an SEC disclosure that's required by law. In the most recent 13F filing, uh, the church's portfolio of publicly traded securities is $54.7 billion. This is not every financial investment the church owns. This only reflects the, the public securities that any, anybody can buy on a public exchange of some kind, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, so on. The reason the SEC requires this report is because any organization or individual that's trading a total portfolio above a certain size has to tell the public what it's traded, what it's bought and sold, what it owns after the fact. So it's a quarterly disclosure of what happened in the previous quarter. Um, and so we not only know how much this portfolio is worth, worth each quarter when, the, when, when Enzyme Peak files this report, we also know what stock the church owns and which companies and so on. Um, what this does not include is any real estate holdings, any privately traded investments, and this would be an investment that you can't buy on New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or something like that. And that's pretty sizable, actually, the amount that doesn't fit into this filing. Uh, we know, according to Elder Bednar, and Elder Gilbert has since repeated this number, we know that the church spends around a billion dollars a year on higher education. That's BYU, uh, BYU-Idaho, BYU-Hawaii, Enzyme College. Um, I don't know if this, if this number includes seminaries and institutes. My guess is that it does. Um, it's a big number, a billion is a lot of money to spend on church education. Um, I will very rarely during this conversation tell you what my guesses are about things, and I always want to make sure you know it's just a total guess, okay? <laughs> so this is like me sitting down and making a rough guess. I, my guess is that the church probably spends about $17,000 per BYU student in addition to what they're already paying in tuition and everything. It's a massive subsidy to uh, education. BYU is f uh, doing a phenomenal thing that way. Obviously, I'm biased because I get paid out of that. So, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the latest report we talked about, over $1.3 billion in humanitarian aid, according to the church. That includes all kinds of things, not just philanthropic giving around the world, but it also includes the welfare program. It also includes um, other church social services, like adoption services or other things. Um, we know a few things that came out in media statements. Bishop Waddell some time ago in it, uh, on uh, 60 Minutes talked a bit about church finances. We know, for example, from Bishop Waddell that um, the, uh, um, the Gateway, not Gateway, um, City Creek investment has been profitable for the church. He shared that detail, so we know the church made back its investment off of that. Um, and then we also know the annual audit report of the church. I, I think people sometimes gl gl gloss over this one as an unimportant detail, but if any of you have ever participated in a ward or, or branch audit, financial audit, which happens twice a year, by the way, which is more frequent than most organizations like this, at most it's typically annually, um, you know what that church audit report means because you've been on the receiving end of it, right? Having to answer all the questions to make sure that all the financial details have been managed properly. There is an intense audit culture within the church and a really strong culture of respecting the widow's might. Uh, you, it shows up 
all the time. So, okay, what we don't know is pretty much everything else. And I'm included in this. I want to make sure it's really clear. I am not up here speaking as a person with inside knowledge. In fact, I think it's kind of nice that I don't have any, because I can be blunt about it. Nobody has read me in. I've, nobody's shown me financial reports. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't gotten access to any information that's not publicly available. And so I'm just speaking based on what's been made public. Um, and the fact that I can hopefully give you confidence in the church's um, truly legal, like the church is operating in a way that's respectful of the law. Um, we'll talk about the SEC settlement in a moment. Um, but the fact that the church is operating within the bounds that it ought to, um, you know, as a member of society and so on, is something I can say with confidence, even, you know, based on what we know. So I will say this, I think it's almost certainly true that $100 billion is the wrong number, and there are reasonable guesses that the number is actually higher. Um, it is definitely true that the IRS whistleblower data, which is now about five years old, is out of date. Uh, not only that, but it was probably inaccurate to begin with. It was a very, at the very least incomplete. And most other analyses that you find out there, um, I think one of the most interesting out there is the Widows Might Report, are based on assumptions and projections, not based on inside information. This is how they compensate for missing data, is by making projections. Uh, to the, their credit, they're, they're very transparent about how they make those assumptions so that you're not guessing as to why they're guessing or arriving at their guesses. Um, but uh, they make that data, um, but they do, they do a lot of guessing, um, which is what you have to do when you don't know uh, the, the details. Okay, so let's, I gotta speed up. All right, so um, some mo common misconceptions about nonprofits, and this isn't just about the church in particular, but about nonprofits generally, and it gets applied to the church. The church is tax exempt as what's called a 501c3. That's a phrase many of you have heard before. The C3 designation means that the federal tax law considers the church a charity. Charity in the colloquial sense might mean philanthropy. Charity in a legal sense means an organization that qualifies as a 501c3. Lots of things can be considered charity under a federal tax law. A youth soccer team is a charity under tax law. A research institution, like a scientific research institution, is a charity under tax law. There are a lot of different things that qualify as charitable for that charitable status, and the church is one of them. And churches actually get this special status, and this is true from 1913 when the federal tax code was first, when the income tax was first crafted by Congress. Since 1913 on, churches specifically do not have to file a tax return. They don't have to file, and church doesn't just mean a place of worship, it can mean a lot of things. BYU, for example, is treated as a church under tax law, and that's why you don't also see a tax return for BYU. Um, again, this is all appropriate under federal uh, tax laws. Um, but this is why you don't see tax returns from the church, because they don't even send them in. There's a, neat, there's a thing called a 990T, but we won't talk about that, because it doesn't address very much. Churches are all, like other nonprofits, are not barred from owning or investing in things. They, they can own stock and they can, and, and, and they can buy and sell ownership and, and other things. It actually makes the most sense. It would be really strange if we said, hey, if you're a church, you have to put your money in a savings account and nothing else. That's a weird way to make somebody manage their investments or their financial resources. They have basically the same financial resource, uh, investment opportunities at their disposal that you know, any other entity would have. This is why beneficial life and City Creek investments are legal, by the way, despite the whistleblower's claims. Churches are not limited to maximum financial holdings. There's no cap for how much a church can own, financially speaking, and so there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no violation of the law there either. And uh, the way the tax law works is that there are also these things called integrated auxiliaries, which are nonprofit corporations that are so deeply affiliated with the church that they get the church treatment by extension. Enzyme Peak is an integrated auxiliary. This is why we don't see a tax return from Enzyme Peak either. Um, this is a point of detail that the whistleblower has gotten repeatedly wrong claiming that Enzyme Peak shouldn't, first of all, in his first 
report, he didn't even address the existence of integrated auxiliaries, which shows that he got pretty poor legal counsel in drafting that, uh, that whistleblower report. Um, and then finally, churches do still have to respect tax-exempt laws against what are called private benefit, excess benefit transactions, and so on. If church leaders um, or managers were taking church assets and using them to profit in improper ways financially, the IRS would have authority to go after and punish that. They're not exempt from those kinds of laws. And we know that the IRS has plenty of opportunities to investigate the church and hasn't brought any charges against them along those lines. This is, I think, one of the best points to reflect on, not just in this context, but in all of it. There are no hidden Ferraris or Italian villas. Okay, like, like the, the leaders of the church are not amassing personal fortunes being reaped from foolish tithe payers and then using those fortunes to enrich themselves personally or their friends or family. That's just not happening. If it was, we would have plenty of whistleblowers to report it. The idea that the church is somehow obsessed about money is a strange accusation for a bunch of people that are foregoing um, quite a bit of wealth opportunities to be responsible for managing all this. Uh, by the way, even the folks that work at Enzyme Peak are underpaid. I'm just saying it's true. And I know that because I've talked to some of them. Okay. There's also another misconception that the church is one entity. It is in a spiritual sense. It is not in a legal sense. Here's an incomplete list of entities that are the church. These are all separate legal entities, meaning you can go look up their filings and see how they're legally distinct from each other. That includes the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, each of the higher education institutions. Property Reserve is the, is the corporation that controls a large portion of their real estate. Intellectual Reserve owns all their copyrights. Ag Reserves owns their, their agricultural real estate. Uh, Desert Management Corporation manages a bunch of the church's um, businesses, including like um, Desert News. Uh, the PCC in Hawaii is a separate legal entity. DMBA, which is an insurance company, provide, is a separate legal company. Same goes for Desert Trust. Um, these are all distinct legal entities that are part of what we colloquially call the church. And they all are part of one thing in the sense that they're controlled centrally by, by church leadership, but they are all legally distinct from each other. And this list isn't even close, because first of all, I haven't gone international, and the church has I don't know how many international entities under this umbrella, but it also missed a bunch of the domestic ones. So, okay. Oh, sorry, and the for-profit entities, I forgot to say, also, they all pay taxes. Any for-profit entity controlled or managed by the church or owned by the church pays income tax on their profits. They're not exempt from that just because they're owned by the church. Okay, my take on the whistleblower report. First, it's important to know that nonprofit law is a niche area of the law that's very complicated. You can have a practice area that exists of nothing but nonprofit law. And the vast majority of experts, both members of the church and not members of the church, have concluded that the church is in compliance with the law, even taking as true the whistleblower's claims. The whistleblower just had the law wrong, repeatedly. And unfortunately, the whistleblower also continues to make both basic and nuanced mistakes about tax law, um, which really frustrates me because years later, that's not an excuse. There's been so much public con commentary and analysis of this. Um, the CNN, sorry, the, the 60 Minutes report where the whistleblower said like, well, I'm not a tax law expert. I'm like, you had four years to become one. That's not a good excuse. Okay. The report that he submitted to the IRS was undoubtedly written for public consumption. I mean, you know this just by saying that it was a letter to an IRS director, which may ring a bell, <laughs> right? You don't title, there's no IRS examiner who got anything out of that title. The IRS, like, like it is 100% that report was written for public consumption. But what it did, because it was filed as a whistleblower report, is it gave the whistleblower legal cover um, to disclose information despite a non-disclosure agreement. So what he did was legal, but it wasn't really written for the IRS. The IRS has now had over five years to take action on this report and still hasn't done so. And uh, 
The fact that it hasn't means you can trust that it's probably not going to. And by the way, the IRS actually requires extra deference for churches by law. And uh, without new evidence, I don't think you should expect IRS action on this, on these claims. And like I said, there's not evidence of unjust enrichment, which is what tax laws, federal, the nonprofit tax law is mostly meant to prevent. Okay, SEC settlement. I have very little expertise in this area. And there is very little expert commentary in this area. I have come to the conclusion now, a year and a half later, or whatever it is, that this is such a niche set of consequences that you couldn't even call this a practice area. That you couldn't even say like, yeah, there are attorneys who specialize in 13F filings. I just don't think that's true. I have searched, I have talked to other people who have more expertise in securities law. They shrug their shoulders. This was a very unique set of circumstances that led to this outcome. So I'll get into some details on it. Uh, if you invest more than $100 million, you have to report with that form that I told you about. Um, the only consequence of this report is public disclosure. There are no tax consequences attached to the 13F filings. There are, it has zero effect on their tax exempt status because we're talking SEC versus IRS. The only reason this report exists is so we can know what large financial institutions have done with their money after they've done it. That is the, that is the purpose of this report. Um, and in fact, many in the industry have argued that $100 million is far too low of a threshold for this requirement. Um, over two decades, here's what happened. Enzyme Peak used a growing list of subsidiary LLCs. So Enzyme Peak owned a growing list of smaller uh, organizations, and then it started reporting its trades through those LLCs. And the purpose was to not make it publicly known what financial investments the church owned and managed. It was at the end of 2019 that EPA started doing a single filing, and that's why we have that publicly. In the SEC settlement, the church neither admitted wrongdoing or disputed the SEC depiction of events. That's a very common outcome in a settlement, is where the party that's settling says, we don't agree um, with what you said, but we also aren't arguing with what you said. Now that sounds like a strange distinction, but legally it's actually really important. Because the church is saying, we don't endorse what the SEC is saying about this, but we're not going to fight them on it. Um, a few commentators have noted that the SEC typically in a settlement document will be aggressive, as aggressive as they can get away with in interpreting the details. So you can expect that the, S the way the SEC framed certain topics may not have actually been true according to the framing. Um, and the church might have, and I think probably disagree with the SEC's depiction of the facts and the law, but chose to settle instead. The reason the church chose to settle makes all kinds of sense in the world, which is that the whole purpose of this structure was to obscure their financial trades. Um, and, uh, and once the SEC brought the charges, that benefit was gone. Um, and so, uh, that's the point I just said there. There are some notable things in the SEC settlement that are worth mentioning. Had the LLCs truly controlled the investments, because the, the, the charge was the LLCs aren't really controlling these investment decisions, it's Ensign Peak controlling all 13. And as long as th those, aren't, those 13 LLCs are not acting independently, then that's what violated this filing requirement. Um, had the LOCs truly had independent control of the financial assets they were put in charge of, then they wouldn't. Then the church wouldn't have broke, wouldn't have broken the law according to the SEC. Um, it is true that the church audit department warned church leaders that the SEC may dispute the structure that the church was using. Um, that term "may" is actually carries a lot of weight, <laughs> legally speaking. Because it wasn't like church audit department. According to the SEC, the church audit department didn't show up and say, like, this is going to get punished, you're breaking the law. That's been portrayed that way, but even the SEC doesn't claim that that happened. Um, it is true that Enzyme Peak took additional steps to obscure the LLCs, giving them generic names, even using generically named managers. 
uh, that is 100% the product of creative lawyering. <laughs> I'm just telling you, like, there are lawyers who specialize in obscuring financial assets because of the wisdom and protecting it for legal purposes, and that's just creative lawyers. So you can think that's terrible still because it's lawyers, but, um, and I'm saying that as a former lawyer, so, okay. Um, this, I think, is one of the most important and interesting points here. The SEC did not choose to pursue additional punishments, even though it could have. Well, it, it, it could have pursued them. I don't think it would have gotten them. When the SEC goes after people it, for, for wrongdoing, it often goes after them for what's called disgorgement, which means any of the profits you got from your behavior, you have to give back or, or get rid of. And the SEC didn't pursue disgorgement against the church or use any of the other more serious tools at their disposal. This is why you've heard some commentators call this the equivalent of a speeding ticket under the law. But I think an even more apt description personally is that this is like getting a speeding ticket where there's not a clearly posted sign. I think that's, I think that's, a, I think that's a fair description of it. It's simply because the law on this appears based on other experts, and there aren't very many of them, other experts talking about some ambiguity as to the law and how the SEC interprets it. There's less ambiguity now because it's the SEC, you know, came after the church for it. Okay, uh, James Huntsman lawsuit. This one has gotten less attention, but there are enough people who know about it that I thought it was worth mentioning. There are also similar lawsuits floating around following the model that James Huntsman set out. James Huntsman, if you don't know, is a former member of the church um, who paid a, a large amount of tithing because of his wealth and, uh, and claims that the church defrauded him out of his tithing by misrepresenting how the tithing would be used. I want to emphasize that legally it's true that gifts are not contracts. If you give something to somebody, it's not a contract, but once you give it, it's done. Um, and so that's the second point, they're irrevocable. So gifts are not contracts, and by default, gifts are irrevocable, meaning you can't take it back. Um, James Huntsman and others are suing based on a claim that their donation was fraudulently induced. Very specifically, uh, James Huntsman points to President uh, Hinckley saying that tithing dollars would not be used to build City Creek, uh, which the, ch the church has explained, it came out of investment proceeds. Huntsman argues that the investment proceeds of tithing still count as tithing. This is where the law is actually pretty important because here James Huntsman is claiming that his definition of tithing should, pre should prevail compared to the church's definition of tithing. Like where the church says tithing is, is in conflict with what James Huntsman says tithing is. That is a, an intensely unrealistic First Amendment issue to claim that a church doesn't get to define its own religious terms. If the government were to show up and say, no, James Huntsman is right about what tithing means and the church is wrong, tithing, doesn't, tithing means lots of things to lots of, of different faiths. And for the government to step in here at James Huntsman's urging and say, hey, church, your definition of tithing is wrong would be a violation of the First Amendment, I think. Um, because religious organizations have priority in defining what their religious terms actually mean. It would be bad for all nonprofits if James Huntsman, James Huntsman wins, not just churches. Because if it wins, it means that any donor who misunderstands a nonprofit could claim fraud. That if I listen to what a nonprofit says, I, get, I misunderstand what they say, and then give them a donation, and then later say, I misunderstood, you defrauded me. That sets a horrible precedent for all nonprofits in the United States. It would be a catastrophically bad decision for the court to uphold it, which is why it actually got dismissed at the district level. Um, three Ninth Circuit judges revived it, and it's now awaiting an on-bank hearing, which means more of the justices in the Ninth Circuit, or judges in the Ninth Circuit, I said justices before, more judges in the Ninth Circuit are gonna hear it. So it may get booted still, like when, from when the district court kicked it out. Even if it goes back for further um, the legal process, I don't think it's gonna get anywhere. So I think it's very unlikely to succeed. Okay, transparency and its purposes. 
I teach ethics, and transparency is a topic I talk about in my classes. The reasons transparency matters is to discourage wrongdoing. This is one of the reasons you want to just use transparency. You want to put it in place where you, the transparency allows people to inspect what's happening so that dishonest people won't um, abuse the resources they've been trusted with. And this transparency also exists to provide information for those that are entitled to know. Um, here are examples of non-public financial information that we might want to know, but we're not entitled to know. Church tax filings are one of them. All churches, not just the Church of Jesus Christ. Corporate tax filings are, are, are private. Uh, finances of closely held companies are private. Individual tax filings are private. I don't get to read any of your 1040s. There's some of you where I might find it interesting. I don't know, maybe for nerdy reasons, but, but those are private as well. Investment portfolios smaller than $100 million and donations to super PACs are all examples of things where we'd love, in many, some of these cases, we'd love to know what's happening. But it's private information according to the government. Cost of transparency. Disclosure requirements often lack important details. If you disclose, but you're not disclosing full details, it gives more like fertile ground for misunderstandings. Um, and uh, it's true that available information, that misunderstandings are unavoidable because people will take details out of their con full context. Um, there's actually some research on something called the sunshine effect by Daly and Kane and his co-authors that found that transparency in some instances actually encourages bad behavior because you sort of, you disclose, and you say, well, we told everybody, so we're gonna do the bad thing, because we told them. Um, and then finally, um, sometimes with a, dis a transparency disclosure, sometimes confidential information actually accidentally gets included. This is actually a common mistake in the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits uh, have to file a report of who their donors are and what amounts were donated above a certain threshold. That's actually not public information, but sometimes nonprofits, like nonprofit accountants accidentally include it in like the version of the tax filing that goes on the website. So donors are having their privacy violated accidentally by these nonprofits who make this mistake. Being opaque has its cost too, though. Trust is harder to establish when you're being opaque. Um, opportunity increases for false accusations because you're not sharing information to dispute the accusations. Um, it's expensive and time-consuming to keep things secret, and uh, people are much more likely to reach inaccurate conclusions. Does the church owe finance? Oh, and I want to say, on that previous slide, I, I am supremely confident that the leaders of the church know everything I've just said. I think that they understand the trade-offs, they know the benefits and the costs of disclosing financial data and have thus far chosen not to disclose it, and, and I don't have a reason to dispute that. Does the church owe financial transparency to its members or the public legally? No. Um, ethically, it's a complex question that needs to weigh things like the implied contract between the institutions and their supporters, the risks and benefits of expert managers being able to make decisions free of outside criticism, and so, and the rights of private institutions to be free from government um, intrusion. So I think all those things need to be considered when you think about this question. Okay, church finances and context. I haven't updated this information because it was a lot to look up. <laughs> so I haven't updated it. This is a chart that shows total assets under management in billions by different entities. And I realize you're too far away to read the text. So that really big one right there is the Norway Government Pension Fund, which manages about one and a half trillion dollars. That comes from fees that they charge on people um, getting uh, oil and natural gas from government property. The next one is the China Investment Corp, Abu Dhabi. Then you see the church. I put the number at 150 billion just as a guess. Uh, Alaska, Permanent Wo uh, Wealth Fund, uh, University of Texas, uh, Investment Management Corporation, the 55 billion is the Gates Foundation, 49 billion is Harvard University, 48 is an organization called Fidelity Charitable, 43 million is New Mexico State Investment Corporation, and 41 billion is Yale University. If you take those numbers and divide them by population, of people that might have a moral claim on the money. This is the money per capita, basically. 
And so you can see that Norway has about $270,000 per citizen saved up in this investment account. Harvard, if you use just students, has $1.2 million saved up in investments per student. And Yale has $1.3 million saved up per student. I've had people criticize my numbers when I've done this. The church is around $8,800. I'm using the math I was using, which involves some guessing. If you do assets per capita, where I, 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 I change some assumptions. I'm gonna throw in alumni to, the, to Harvard and Yale, and I'm gonna reduce the number of church members, which I don't think is fair, but people have criticized my commentary on this. I'm gonna reduce the church members from 17 million to five million, which is a claimed number of, of active on a weekly basis church members. Even making those changes, um, the church is, still has $30,000 per member, whereas Harvard has 139,000 and Yale has 256,000 um, per, per capita, basically. Uh, I think this is, oh, and by the way, the reason I have Gates and Fidelity at $7 and $6 is because as, as philanthropic organizations, their only job is to give money away, I included the global population as per capita. <laughs> because they have a lot of money. <laughs> okay, all right, so let's get to the idea of giving it away. According to Elder Bednar, the church is not and should not be considered as a primarily philanthropic organization. Its purpose is to preach the gospel and lead people through covenants back to their Heavenly Father and to Jesus Christ. That's its purpose. Um, that said, it does engage in philanthropy, and a sizable amount of it actually. Um, I'm going to skip this because my time is going quickly here. Uh, just know that philanthropy is dominated by large organizations. About a quarter of, of gifts that are given out every year in, in the form of philanthropy, meaning like professional foundations, are given away by about 2% of foundations. I mean, it's a, it's a, there's a huge concentration of wealth in the philanthropic sector. Um, this is just shows you how much philanthropic capital can swing based on economic changes. Um, during the 2008 crisis, uh, a lot of foundations and charities saw their, saw their endowment shrink by 30%. It's a huge change. Um, here's a list of philanthropic giving by the church just spanning a two-month period. And this is just based on scanning the church newsroom, so it doesn't include all church philanthropy. But this is an example of the kind of stuff that the church is doing. You go on the newsroom now, and you can't scroll more than a few articles without reading about um, some philanthropic endeavor the church is engaged in somewhere in the world. And like I said, these just came from church newsroom. Um, what if the church step, stepped up the, the amount substantially? which they're in the process of doing. I mean, and I'm not saying this as somebody with inside knowledge. This is just by observation. Church humanitarian efforts went from 1 billion to 1.3 billion just in a one year span. There's every reason to believe that the church is accelerating its, its philanthropic giving. But what if they did it big? What would it look like? Well, giving money, despite perception, is actually hard to do well. You can give it foolishly and recklessly and waste a lot of it. If you want to give it well, there requires some expertise. Most large foundations spend a dollar on staff and other expenses for every four to seven dollars they give away. That's how expensive it can be to give the money away well. Given smaller salaries, which you'd expect, because that's a pattern in how the church operates, you could expect a one to $10 ratio, for example. So if the church took $50 billion and said, we're dedicating this to philanthropy, it would mean annual giving around three to $4 billion. It would probably require 300 to about 1,000 employees um, to do it well, and the annual operating expenses would be around $300 million just to give the money away. This is how professional philanthropy works, and this is how to do it well. And so if the church wanted to give away this much money well, you would expect them to employ more people, which I can say anecdotally, they're involving more people in their charitable giving right now, their philanthropic giving. Okay, key conclusions. 
The church's financial history is constant change. We know less than we think we do about church finances, so don't be too confident. <laughs> There's no compelling evidence that the church violated federal tax law. The SEC settlement, according to the SEC story, you should not assume it's the whole story. Um, the church is today unlike anything in the world, and so comparisons are never gonna be totally fitting. Um, and the church is rapidly increasing its philanthropic activity just by observation. Why I pay tithing. I'll tell this story very briefly. When my wife and I were first married, we had our son Luke, who was a pretty skinny baby. Then we had our son Seth, who was a very chubby baby. And none of the clothes fit him well. And so my wife, and we were poor college students, I was in grad school, and my wife prayed that we would come up with some extra money so she could buy some warm clothes for our son. And she just wanted a pair of jeans that would fit our chubby little baby Sam. And she prayed for that for a while. And uh, then we had neighbors show up, the Zoom Y view, who had the first grandson on both sides of the family. And this little kid was showered <laughs> with gifts from loving grandparents. And this, this family, friends of ours, brought over three garbage bags full a brand new clothing, and my wife opened the first garbage bag, and right on top was the was the pair of jeans she was hoping to buy for our son. Um, this is why I pay tithing. It's a covenant I made with God. It's a covenant I've made to show Him gratitude, and uh, and to honor this relationship. Um, and it's a commandment, and that's why I pay tithing. I trust that the Lord knows what he's doing with all this money, and I'll be clear, it's a lot, but, um, but I trust that, um, uh, and that's why I pay tithing. So I'll leave that with you, and I think these slides are shared, and if you have questions or you have loved ones who have questions about any of this stuff, I'm very happy to answer them. My email address is aaronmiller at byu.edu. I can be found pretty easily online. And don't hesitate to reach out. I've fielded questions over the last couple of years on this topic. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>